like the fourth half. I don't know what it is. It's, it's, they've been many halves. Take your seats, everyone. Everyone just scuttling to where they want to sit. That's very good. Very nice. Lovely. Um, so some of you might be wondering what's happened to Tumi, or Tumi, um, as you're supposed to call her. She was here, and now she's gone. Um, she's, she's backstage, and she can't move. I'm so, I'm so impressed with myself. Um, she... <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but she needed medical attention. Um, I think she's pinched the nerve, but let me dream. Um, um, no, she can't. She, her back's fucked. And then it was funny because she saw herself on an ad. She's like, that's me. I'm like, yes, you sell out. Anyway, so, because I don't do ads. I don't find them uh, good. So we have our next panel, and then uh, we'll have a, a short interlude by Deep Fried Man again. And then we have um, um, the Commander-in-Chief of the uh, Economic Freedom Fighters. I think I got that right. Yep, uh, I know, I know. I'm so excited. I barely wait. And uh, so <laughs> I'm not really political. This is my problem at all. Are, are you political? Would you describe yourself? In? Okay, no, you're needy. I wasn't looking at you. It's the lady. <laughs> You responded like an American. Um, um, the lady, not political. Do you feel it's, do you need to be, is it important? I mean, it's like, you know, economics. Do you need that every day on the radio? Someone telling you the free market shifted. Seriously. Wow. Every day at seven o'clock. We're up. We're down. Yes, it's a free market system. Purple, it will do that. Um, I don't know why someone has to keep watching it all the time. It's pointless. Anyway, so that's lovely. So our next panel is quite interesting. It's about media, which I assume is relevant to some people in this room. Um, there are some people here who call themselves journalists. You're not really. <laughs> you cut and paste. And then... You've, I've done it before with you. I send you a press release for my show, and you just cut and paste it. Fucking great job. Well done. Hand this woman a Pulitzer immediately. Um, I don't think I'm going to hold it against them, because let's not punish people just because they're from somewhere which shouldn't be mentioned, because the citizen doesn't deserve to be victimized like that. Um, um, so, so that's important. But then there are great writers as well. So hopefully we'll hear about the, I don't know, everyone talks about new media, as if that's going to give you a big, lazy chubby. Um, it's just t Twitter and digital, really. It's not that it's not new media for children. That's what they were born with, Paul. Um, so that's quite exciting. So to chair this phenomenal panel about uh, media, uh, new media, and freedom thereof, new freedom, um, please will you uh, welcome Rebecca Davis. Are you, hang on, we've got to get you plugged in, apparently, because otherwise it's all awkward and then it's weirdness. And here comes your panel as well. Well, this is all very... Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Hi, Gareth. I haven't seen you since the roast, actually. Um, <laughs> should we get Steve Hoffmeyer back for a rematch? Um, are you in, ma'am? Am I? No, you can't ask me that. I'm not the sound Hello? Guy. Are you? If you talk, does it make a louder noise? No. It doesn't. No. Then you're not in, then. But maybe you're not on. She's in, but she's not on. Is Am that I right? on? Am I in? Kay. Oh, you're in Am now. I audible? Talk some more. Am I audible? You are so audible. Bye. Lovely. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here at the media panel of The Gathering. We've been told we're under excruciating time pressure because we don't want the Commander-in-Chief to decide he wants to start celebrating his exams <laughs> early. So we've been cut down to 45 minutes, so we've really got to push it a bit. Um, nonetheless, hoping that it will be an interesting discussion and that we'll have a bit more difference of opinion than that consensus fest that was the business panel. Um, we do have a, a, a very diverse group of, of panelists here. Um, I'm hoping it'll be a bit more, in fact, like the social justice panel we saw earlier, but with Gareth taking the role of the deputy justice minister. <laughs> I thought that could be fun. We're going to give our panelists a chance to make a few introductory statements. Um, I think let's kick off with Lumko Mtumde, who's the CEO of the Media Development and Diversity Agency, former. former, which was a development agency set up to promote media diversity. Lumko has a long career in broadcasting regulation and has lobbied extremely heavily for media transformation, which is often said is not happening at a fast enough pace in South Africa. And he has also worked for government in the Department of Communications. Thanks, Lumko. Good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. 
Thank you, um, and let me also just thank uh, Daily Maverick and its partners for putting up this kind of an event, um, and I feel honored to be part of this uh, panel. Greetings to my panelists. Um, we've just been asked to discuss the state of media from different angles in a very short space of time which is a big task. South Africa has a legislative framework based on its constitution that protects freedom of expression, including media freedom, which promotes access to information, right to communicate, independent regulation, media development and diversity. So indeed, it's an enabling legislative framework. And accordingly, a number of institutions have been established to give meaning and effect to uh, those provisions in our law, which includes the ICASA, the MDDA, NEMISA, now called ICAMVA, the MIGCITA, the ICT Charter, the MEC Charter, etc. A lot of work has been done by these institutions. In the 21 years of our democracy, the media environment has changed significantly, more so in the broadcasting industry, with public, community, and commercial stroke private services all overseen by a, and regulated by an independent regulator, ICASA, over and above the self-regulation by their own body, which is BCCSA. Sadly, Little has transformed in the, in the print media industry across the value chain, from newsrooms, publishing, printing, distribution, research, and advertising. This has been confirmed not only by independent research reports, two by the MDDA, one in 2009 and another one in 2014, but also by reviews conducted by the industry itself, one by the Press Freedom Commission and the other one by the Print and Digital Media Transformation Task Team. Whilst there is community and small commercial media supported by the MDDA, the environment they operate under is not enabling. Largely, they most of the time rely on the dominant concentrated media houses for printing and distribution and proving their existence and circulation through the ABC. ABC is a company established by the concentrated media owners, and its board not only is white dominated, but is dominated by representatives from the very concentrated media owners. Whereas regulation of this media is by structures set up and funded by the same concentrated media owners through their body, the PDMSA. Very interestingly, even against the acknowledgement of best practice and globally accepted principle of independent regulation by the PFC, this untransformed print media industry resists independent regulation and pushes for self-regulation. Recommendations from the print Digital Media Transformation Task Team and the PFC are not being fully implemented. Editors are organized under the SANEF umbrella, a very important organ of the profession, whose representativity is also questionable. Not all the editors of the biggest broadcaster in the continent, the SABC, and the fast growing community broadcasting sector are proportionally participating in the forum. Even with respect to print media, not all editors from some of the new players like the New Age are participating in the forum. This does not suggest I'm questioning its role. I am simply saying our challenge in South Africa is to ensure we represent fairly our diversity. Whenever very important questions are asked in respect of transformation of the media, the hysteric tendency and reaction is to cry a threat to media freedom. I argue that media transformation is not a threat to media freedom, instead the opposite. Concentration of media ownership and control 
in few hands is a real threat to our democracy. We need a free and diverse media representative of diverse views and opinions, including class, gender, rural, and other perspectives. The right of the public to a free media is indisputable. It is an essential component of South Africa's democracy, which depends on informed citizens participating in all aspects of our country. There are many aspects of this, and for the media to play its role, it needs to be trusted and seen as credible by the public. Independent regulation is crucial to this. It is intended to act in the public interest and provide a means for redress if any publication breaches the fundamental responsibility of journalism to tell the truth. It is now three years after the press committed to addressing flaws identified in the system of self-regulation in response to the findings of the PFC headed by the late Chief Justice Bias Langer. May his soul rest in peace. If the new system worked, though, we should be seeing its effect on the pages of newspapers. With a higher commitment and more effort put into reporting the truth rather than distorting this for a sensational headline to sell the newspaper. The problem is that is not that self-regulated system does not find the media at fault. It does, and there's a number of uh, examples, but I'm not going to go into that to save time. The problem is that it simply orders the publishers to say, sorry, I'm sorry, for their blunders. The PFC, as well as a number of international protocols, including the Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression in Africa, acknowledge independent regulation mechanism as appropriate for the regulation of journalistic content. It is also accepted by a number of constitutional dispensations that protect media freedom, the protection of media freedom and the regulation ought to be performed through the post-publication post administration of complaints and not pre-publication censorship. I'm going to ask you to wrap it up. Okay. But will a system that does not affect the bottom line of publishers or the performance bonuses of editors and journalists ever really ensure that ethics are adhered to? The danger of not doing this is that the media will increasingly be viewed with skepticism and the falling circulation of print publications might be due in part at least to their lack of credibility and relevance to readers. In response, there is an argument by some in the media when we talk about ineffectiveness of self-regulation that readers have an option to not buy a newspaper when it loses its credibility. I think this argument is flawed. Which newspaper in the South African context will you buy if you decide not to buy our daily and Sunday newspapers? Perhaps the argument could work if we had media diversity. Besides, saying, saying media must be regulated by an independent regulator is just another way of saying media must be as accountable as it is required of everyone in the society. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. As we're going along, please do tweet your questions just using the hashtag DM Nando's Gathering. I see we already have one for Gareth, in fact, somebody wanting to know how it is that you still look 12 years old. <laughs> um, Gareth is, in fact, next up. He needs little introduction, I'm sure, but um, one of South Africa's best known voices and faces, established himself as a household name as the presenter for 5FM's breakfast show, has now daringly struck out on his own with the internet radio station Cliff Central, and is also known for his hard-hitting and often wrong opinions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you see, I, I really should have prepared something, but Lumko's rather made my task a lot easier today because he made such a lovely speech for 1985. <laughs> when printing and distribution were the chief challenges of people in the media business. I, I know that there are many people here who still like the feel of a newspaper and the way it makes your fingers look. 
after you've rifled through it, and I don't doubt that there are many, many people who are extraordinary at bringing us the very best and, 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 and most trustworthy news in the printed form as it, as it always has been. But I do think the interesting battle that you face, Limco, is not against the media, but against everyone on earth who has Twitter and against everyone on earth who has any access to the internet because this is where the media resides now and welcome, these are the media, these people here. It's no longer the proviso of an editor to decide what the talkable topic of the day is. It's no longer something that can be put in the agenda of a newsroom. The exciting thing about living in 2015 is that all of this is available to all of us all the time, depending on just how much we'd like to absorb, how much we wouldn't like to absorb. It was interesting, Lumka, I saw your Twitter account is protected. <laughs> so we can't see your innermost thoughts. Everybody else here, anyone got their tweets protected? Uh, usually it's only people who are frightened of being stalked who have that sort of protection on their Twitter account. Now, I didn't mean to turn this into a, a reply to your point of view, but I do think that there are many things about your point of view that worry me. Uh, first and foremost, that you seem to think that media freedom can be put into the same argument as media diverse, diversity and ownership, which I, I think is a very relevant topic for discussion and one which I am probably going to find myself on your side for in most of these circumstances. But media freedom, freedom of expression, is something that I have never met anyone on the opposing side to, except for Kim Jong-un, I've never met him. Um, but I should hope there aren't any people in this room who would prefer that we could not have this conversation today, who would prefer that there were somewhere among us a censor. And if there were a censor in this room, who's going to choose him? And if you choose that censor and you don't like him, you're stuck with him. If you don't like the censor, what's your appeal? Ultimately, surely freedom of expression has to be something, certainly in the, in the form of of social media and the internet as it allows itself to be used now. This is something which is the fundamental source of all the other rights. If we can't think, say what we think, do what we, we say, these are not only the, the, the definitions of integrity, these are also the definitions of the basis of every other right in our constitution. If you don't have freedom of expression first, the others don't come into play. You have to be able to discuss the others. If you can't do that in free speech, free expression, they can't exist. This is not one of those things where you can have some kind of middle ground between the ones who want to regulate us and those of us who believe in freedom of expression. It must be absolute. And don't bring up the children because I don't have any, so it's, I don't care, it's your problem. <laughs> and don't tell me that there are people who are sensitive and who might be offended, so what? Part of being grown up and living in a free, democratic country like ours is that you're going to be upset every now and then. And I'll tell you what, I will defend to the death. This is the only thing you'll find me saying I'll die for. Anyone else's right to disagree with me. In fact, I would rather be in a room where I'm likely to have people disagree with me every day of the week and twice on Sundays than be in the same room with 100 people who agree with me for 10 minutes. I think this is fundamental. And so... So when we talk about media freedom, what we're really talking about is various platforms that must exist in various ways for us to have conversations with each other. An idea that I, I imagine there can't be terribly much opposition to, not among sane, rational, reasonable people in the 21st century. And if you do want to fight that battle, if you do want to get your, your hands dirty in the world of censorship and in the world of media regulation, I think you'll find yourself not only in an increasing minority, but in a place where you're backing into a corner that you're not going to get out of easily. You make yourself the enemy of everyone from the EFF to the ANC to the DA to every other party on the spectrum because their chief means of communicating now is going to be through social media. Their chief means of communicating is not going to be through pamphlets handed out under streetlights or through newspapers or even through internet radio. It's going to be via their own media channels. And this is where people, every person in this room is now a broadcaster, whether you like it or not. I think it's very exciting. I think it's terrific because now all the responsibilities I've had to bear at the Broadcasting Complaints Commission for the last 16 years, you have. 
And we must all be responsible with what we tweet. And it's no longer something we need government to regulate us on, because it's this peer system. It's a marvelous system. If someone says something stupid or racist or bigoted, the rest of us will climb into them. They won't do it again. They'll learn their lesson the hard way. Many people have been caught out. Many people have fallen. I think we're adult enough to regulate ourselves when it comes to freedom of expression. And I don't think there is a media worth making rules about anymore because it's everywhere and it's everyone. This is the benefit of being truly free. This is the benefit of living in 2015. And this is why I believe that this is a genie that has come out of the bottle and you'll never get it back in. Thank you. Third up, we have Songhez Zibi, who started his career in corporate communications for Volkswagen and Extrata before joining the Financial Mail. Today, he is the editor of Business Day and the author of Raising the Bar, Hope and Renewal in South Africa. Thanks, Songhez. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. One of the first things that struck me when I unfortunately and stupidly accepted the job of Business Day editor was was how much time and attention is taken away by the boring stuff, the money, the equipment, the finances, the management of people, securing uh, decent computers and chairs and things for people. And what works and what doesn't work and why it doesn't work and who's going to fix it and why they're still not here to fix it. So this is what you spend most of your time doing. For people outside the newsroom, of course, this stuff is not important, does not exist even. Journalism is one of those things that largely finds itself somehow, yet this is not so. So, to quote Gaten McKenzie, telling Riddhi Direko, uh, said, Riddhi man is very important. It's very, very important. I agree with him, because without it, you can't do anything. And I find it difficult to talk about the state of the media at present without talking about its financial sustainability problems, because it is in a state of flux. The business model doesn't work the way it was initially envisaged. Newspapers used to be like ESCOM. You have to get electricity, otherwise you sit in the dark. You had to get a newspaper, otherwise you don't know what's happening. It's no longer like that anymore. Acts of journalism are performed by people who are not journalists. 702 Eyewitness News. Somebody sees something, they phone in and tell John Robbie. They haven't confirmed it. They tell the rest of us. We don't know. It's unverified. He puts them back to news, but already we start discussing it on Twitter. That's at 7 o'clock in the morning. What is a newspaper going to write about tomorrow, 24 hours later? So these are the kind of challenges that we these are, these are the kind of challenges that we're dealing with. And so to agree with Gareth, to talk about print as the core of media consumption in South Africa, perhaps five years ago, perhaps ten years ago, but information is available in many, many other platforms constantly. At four o'clock every day, we sit and decide what's going to go into the paper. I have my tablet on the one hand, checking Twitter, because the assumptions or the things that we knew 30 minutes ago, by the time we're done with the conference at half past four, they've changed. And by the time we send the newspaper to print at half past nine, it's changed further. Our stuff is old. And because we're a business newspaper, Bruce Whitfield is going to have a two-hour discussion about one or other thing. What do we write about the next day in an environment where you can afford, can only afford, afford to employ so many people or so few people, and that you have these timelines which are from the 18th and 19th century, which print limits you to. So these are real challenges that we cannot, we cannot, we can, we cannot shy, we cannot shy away from. So there's financial sustainability. There is the very operation of a newspaper of a print publication, which is inherently archaic because it does not allow you to respond as fast as you can or as you should to developing events. And therefore, the following day, you're always publishing yesterday's stuff. When people at 8 o'clock are already consuming stuff that happened that morning, there was no 24-hour television at some point in the past. There is now. There was no Twitter. There was no Facebook. There was no WhatsApp. There were no SMS alerts from radio stations and all these other news providers. So these are some of the challenges that we cannot shy away from because the media, which I'm going to talk about now, is largely viewed through a political lens. So it is a political being. So transformation of the media is seen only in that lens, and yet there is a transformation that needs to happen, which is the vehicles through which traditionally people have accessed news information have fundamentally changed. 
and there is a process of irrelevance that's taking place and the battle is for titles to find themselves relevant again and provide this information at a time in a way and in a manner that consumers want. So we need to look at it as a consumer product. But I want to talk about also, which is a very popular topic, about media transformation. And ask a question, because it's often viewed through a racial lens only, and perhaps that is important. I come from a village, and I've read newspapers talking about how 15, 20 people, or however many, died because of diarrhea in some village somewhere in Mount Flesh or Mount Frey, or even in Mkandwili where I come from, right? And then there'll be a long discussion about how ambulances took time to get there and that sort of thing. Yet I come from such communities. If you talk to a medical practitioner, if a person, a child, passes a stool three times in an hour, take them to the doctor. We say we'll see how the child looks like tomorrow morning, and then we'll take them to the doctor. That's what happens. Right, so the child dies, the discussion is focused around ambulances. If you want to bring a diversity of perspectives and understanding of people's experiences, the question is, do you just need a black journalist or do you need a journalist with a rural experience? And that the presentation of that incident takes that into account. That's one example. The second example is the obsession with race. Race is important. We are a country whose contours and shape was built on the basis of racial politics. So we cannot undo this thing without, without talking about race. But let me ask a question. Is a black homophobe as an editor okay? So where do we get these notions that being black gives you certain progressive impulses? <laughs> Is a black sexist as an editor okay? So how do we define progressiveness? What is the anchor of that progressive right? Because your racial phenotype in the definition of progressiveness in South Africa with the constitution that we have as a starting point is not enough. I know of these newspapers which write in a certain way about women where the news editor is a woman. In fact, the news and the deputy news editor are women. So is that transformation? So we've relegated the other important imperatives about the fundamental transformation of society and the presentation of society's problems and society's discussions to racial phenotype only, which is crude and shallow, and we must stop doing it. So, so we want to talk about the opening up of the media space. So what do we want to do? We're making the same mistake we're making about BEE, and I'll explain just now. So the obsession is to make sure that the news organizations we already have, which are private news organizations, that they need to have black owners. What does that change? What does that change? Right? Why aren't we asking why it is so difficult for new entrants to be sustainable in this industry? And it is because the things that I mentioned when I started this, this discussion earlier on about money, about access to capital, about margins which are not there, about profitability, which if you want to run any business and make money, don't go into, into newspapers. Don't. Seriously, if you know anything about money, don't go into newspapers only. So media organizations have to see themselves as content providers. So if we accept, and I'll give you some figures from Business Day just now, if you accept that media is about content and content is available in a number of different platforms, do you necessarily need an obsession? Is the obsession about print and what it does well-founded or not? Or, as Gareth said, it's from 1985. So let me give you some numbers. The circulation of the business day is less than 30,000 at the moment. Between May last year and now, the unique visitors we get a month on BD Live have grown from 482,000 to 730,000. So what's more important? Is it print? or is it access to the information? What matters is whether we have the diversity of perspectives and backgrounds and an attitude which defines progressiveness in terms of this constitution, which we disingenuously say we support. When we don't, 
are but using that as a basis for defining progressiveness. Of course, what Lumko is talking about, about accuracy, about being fair, and about being people, giving people an opportunity to comment is fundamental to journalism. But there is also, like Gareth said, if we all members of the media, people say things about people, there is zero accountability on social media. There is zero accountability when you phone in and you say your name is Mawawa when your name is somebody else. And you make allegations about people. So it's easy to point fingers at other people, and yet we don't want to take responsibility for the picture of a society that we want to build. The last thing I'm going to say is the media is always, the media in all its forms, bloggers, what you get on social media, newspapers, television, and so on, is always a reflection of the society which forms it. There appears to be a belief in South Africa that the media is an abstract animal that dropped off from the heavens. So the transformation that needs to happen in society about gender relations, about class relations, about all of these things needs to happen in the media as well. And you cannot expect, I submit it is stupid actually, to expect that the media is going to be an island and provide these things which the society itself is not. Thank you. Songhez, I can tell you that there are a lot of white people on Twitter who really liked what you just said. <laughs> Last but not least, you met Fatima earlier when she was swearing about having to moderate the social justice panel. Human rights lawyer by training, the executive director of the Open Society Foundation, which literally keeps half of civil society in South Africa afloat. So please tell George Soros thanks very much and don't stop sending those dollars. So um, I feel like I must say, viva comrade, viva. You know, speak truth to power. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's discussions like this where we need to hear from young black journalists and from black editors who, you know, are now becoming increasingly in charge of a number of publications in South Africa to actually raise a number of these issues about our, the false narrative of transformation. And I'll talk about that just now in my presentation, which I'm calling, we all want a free press, but we don't want to support or pay for it, okay? So, like many of you, I grew up under apartheid down the road in Forsberg. Uh, I wouldn't call myself a consumer of news. I would call myself a reader, somebody who's interested in politics and in information. And I grew up in a society which was highly censored. So I remember almost every Friday reading the Rand Daily Mail with blackouts. Um, and so the, the idea of trying to live in an open society, in a democratic society, the one that uh, Gareth talked about earlier, is something that's close to many of our hearts because we know, we know what happens when you when you have the secrecy bill as a law. We know what happens when you have the media tribunals, uh, media appeals tribunal uh, basically being dominated by the state in its regulation of journalists. We know what happens when journalists are set up to write false stories. We know what happens when journalists are assassinated, when they are arrested for speaking truth to power and for holding those in power to account. We're seeing that in Zimbabwe and in Swaziland right now. So we don't want to live in that society ever again. And that's why all of us are concerned about a free and independent media. That's why we're concerned about the right to information and expression, because we know what it was like, and we don't want to go there again. And that's why the Open Society Foundation and all of our partners and grantees are also very sort of committed to that intent. And I wish some of them were speaking here today, for example, like the right to know. But this is not unique to South Africa, and this has got nothing to do with the ANC or DA. I mean, it has some aspects to do with them, but this is not a critique, this is not a fight for the ANC and DA. It's about political power globally. Globally, journalists are under attack. Globally, they're under siege. They are under surveillance. Their sources are under surveillance. It's increasingly difficult to be a whistleblower, to expose state corruption, to expose private sector corruption. Uh, you can be charged with high treason, as we've seen in the US, and similarly in Southern Africa or in Latin America. The consequences are actually quite grave to be a journalist, more so if you want to be an investigative journalist. So it's nothing unique to South Africa. What is unique to South Africa, I would argue, and what is quite different, and for me, marks a seismic shift, and I think that's why I was asked to speak on this panel, is that something happened almost about 12 to 18 months ago, and I don't know where you were, but I remember where I was when I got the news that Alida Danois of the Cape Times was actually fired as an editor. And it was clear to everybody, because we're not idiots, we're not stupid, 
Okay, don't talk about transformation as a ruse to get rid of somebody because you really wanted to because you don't agree with them politically or because they're writing stories about your own company. And that seismic shift was actually what I think has forced people to start thinking about the serious issues in South Africa. And Alina is just one example of many journalists who have been pushed out of newsrooms, who have been taken to the labor court, who are trying to basically save their reputation. And she's symbolic of something that is actually happening in South Africa, which everybody, I think, is quietly just sort of accepting because we're so used to accepting so much of bad news, so much of despair, that we're actually not challenging those in power. And for me, there's five things that happen the same time around a leader's very odd, very forced dismissal. And that is, we saw for the first time clearly, openly, the politicization of our media landscape in South Africa, coupled with commercialization interests. So it was the shareholders, particular ones under the guise of transformation, going into the newsroom to demand ownership, to demand editorial content and to demand choices of editors and journalists and the stories that they would write, introducing self-censorship again in our newsrooms just after we had defeated that uh, sort of around 1994. Thirdly, with that was a decline in print, not just in South Africa, but print globally, which basically is forcing people to talk about the very issues you are, Sangezo, about how do we actually fund a free and independent media going forward. Coupled with that, on top of this very perfect storm, is the growth in digital media, which nobody exactly globally even has quite cracked in terms of figuring out how to make that sustainable and how to make that sort of investment friendly. And then finally, sort of global trends, and we see that in Ireland, we see that in, in the UK, where everybody's going mojo. It's called mobile journalism. Most of your news can actually be basically downloaded on your phone. Of course, in South Africa, that's a bit difficult, and the irony of voter world, uh, of voter world is that the cost of the internet is too high, and our data connection costs are too high. So that's something that needs to be addressed. So transformation, I agree, is more than just race and gender. It's also about writing stories that reflect the true realities of South Africa, that, re that write the stories that challenge the commercial investors, that challenge the deputy minister, that challenge the ANC, that challenge the DA, and that reflect the stories of the people who are most materially excluded and marginalized in our society, from people to, from Kailicha to people to Kaiskamahuk to people to Orange Farm. And because if we don't have those stories, we will continue to live in this little dome and this little bubble where we think that everything's fine and that the only issue we have to deal with is how to attract more foreign direct investment. So obviously we want to live in a society where there are independent views, there are independent opinions, but mainly we need to actually start living in a more serious, mature democracy which exposes corruption at all levels, from the state to the private sector. And the only way you can do that is if you actually fund a free and independent media, which is not beholden to any donor, to any commercial interest, and to any politician. You can't have an editor running a newspaper proclaiming to be independent and free if they are getting daily phone calls, either from Kurs Becker or either from the Tuli House telling you what you did wrong or what you did right that day. So Ngeza, I don't know what kind of phone calls you get every night, but I'd be intrigued to see your, your, your phone list. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to wrap up now because Rebecca will kill me otherwise, and we can talk about the various models globally about how we fund an independent and free media, because there's no easy fix. I'm not going to pretend that there's an easy answer and that we all have the solutions. We, we deal with this in, in relation to how do you provide free legal services to marginalized people. It's a similar debate and a similar argument. But I think there's two things we can do. And there's two challenges that we can address by doing that. The first is we need to start seriously investing in a new layer of strong, young, black, independent, investigative journalists. Because if you don't, in 20 years' time, you will not know about Nkandla or similar scandals. You will not know about Lonman. You will not know about the arms deal. I mean, the list goes on. And that, if you can do properly with proper training, proper leadership, proper skills transfer, will avoid the blunders, will avoid the defamation, and will actually make the media tribunal's bill uh, or the media tribunal panel, which, which government is proposing, redundant. And then the second thing is to address quite seriously the fact that there is a high unemployment crisis, we have more young people in this country who don't have jobs, who feel materially excluded from the society in which we live in, and they can't get access to expensive newspapers or paywall 
websites which provide very important and break, uh, breaking news. And so if we are going to go digital and mobile with our independent and free media, then I'm sorry, the internet has to be free. It's a valuable tool. It should be free to everybody in South Africa. And, and finally, linked to the internet, aside from a massive rollout of, of free Wi-Fi in the whole of South Africa, in the whole of Africa, to every community, to every neglected poor person living in, in this continent, we have to reduce the cost of data. And if the companies that actually provide, or the oligopoly that actually provides data to us refuse to do that, then I think maybe that's possibly ripe for litigation. So I'll end there. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Those were all fantastic and very interesting submissions, and I wish we had more time. Um, we're left with 10 minutes, so let's get cracking, and if you can keep responses as brief as possible. Numka, coming to you first, also because you've worked in government, is the ANC scared of the media? No. <laughs> no, but, but, but let me start from clarifying some of the misconceptions, I think, Gareth and, and, and Fatima has. There's no one who is suggesting that government must regulate media. There's no one. Aren't you suggesting that all the no, time? No, okay. not at all. Independent regulation is not equal to government regulation. In South Africa, independent There's regulation, independent, independent regulation uh, for example, ICASA is independent, no, IEC is independent. No, they're not. Okay, who you can... Who appoints ICASA's council? No, it's, they're not. You nominate yourself. It's political. And, okay, fine. But the point is, <laughs> the point is, um, we should we should not close discussions. The fact of the matter is, the the profession, part of what compromises um, uh, uh, the the growth of our media, is not just um, um, uh, the, the 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 factors that you spoke to. There's a bigger debate. The the profession is declining in terms of ethics, in terms of compliance with the press code, but also for new entrants. There's a question of difficulty to play in this space because this, the, the, the market structure is anti-competitive. The entire value chain is controlled by the concentration of, by the way, when, when we talk of a diversified media ownership and control, therefore it's not just about ownership, it's end control and the entire value chain. And I agree with you that indeed, we're talking here about class, content, we're talking about um, um, gender, uh, uh, balance content, etc. We agree on many of those things. But we shouldn't fear a discussion on transformation by simply saying it is about race. No. Race, of course, it is part of the equation, but it is about all of all those considerations, including content. Okay. Thanks, Limco. So, Ngeza, from your perspective as an editor of a leading newspaper, are the NC scared of the media? I think perhaps not necessarily scared of the media as such, but I think when one is in a position of power, there is a certain threat that naturally comes from access to information that you wouldn't like to see the light of day. And this is common in a lot of governments. We were talking Edward Snowden just the other day, who is still a fugitive from justice in the US, and if he goes back, he'll get arrested, but there are very important reforms that are going to take place as a result of his revelation. So it is a function of being in power. To answer the question, by the way, about who phones me the most, companies listed on the JSE phone me the most. <laughs> I've, had, I've had more lawyers' letters from JSE listed companies, and I've never had one from a politician, not one, in the last year. So it is about power, it is about threat. But I also want to disagree with him. We've got a new entrant right here, and his name is Gareth Cliff, right? Mm -hmm. It is about understanding what consumers want and trying to give it to them in the way that they want it. I do not believe it is necessarily about breaking down anything that already exists. Try and distribute a newspaper on your own with diesel prices going up, with all the other problems that arise out of trying to distribute a newspaper and see how long you'll keep it going. As it is, I am certain independent newspapers, Caxton, Times Media, find it difficult to sustain the economies of this. So you ask me, is business day growing or not? 28,000 circulation per day and almost three quarters of a million per month on the website. No distribution cost, low overheads, and so on, and yet the information is out there for 18 hours a day. Right. So it is about where you choose to play. Okay. And I somehow think we're playing in a space that we should have played four years ago. Okay, Gareth, as Songeza says, you're a new entrant. Have you found 
uh, the, the media market in general to be hostile to new entrants? And also, please, will you give us your listenership figures? <laughs> yeah, we, we have, um, it's interesting, we, we, we're actually, uh, we're looking at about 400,000 podcast downloads a month, which equates to about 100,000 a week. Those are podcasts that obviously people have on the one piece of equipment that you carry with you everywhere you go. So it's almost like a takeaway form of radio. Um, and I, I mentioned the podcast figure because live listening to me isn't important. Um, you can't measure it effectively on radio, let alone on internet radio. Um, it's more useful for advertisers to know that what they want mentioned, the messaging they want, is in a branded content solution in the form of, of a podcast. So that's where the value lies for us. In terms of total downloads, since August last year, we're at about 3.8 million podcasts since then. And I think that's good considering we're a year old and we didn't have investors or government help or necessarily the advertising community behind us when we started this. It's me. You're looking at it. And luckily now it's not just me. I mean, the, the exciting thing, thank you, but the exciting thing for me is that we've created an opportunity here. We've got 38 different shows. I mean, I'll give you a show if you want one. <laughs> looking at your CV, there are a lot of formers there. We can turn into currents. <laughs> I don't mind. And, <laughs> and, like and this is the point. I, I do mean, I do mean this, this is hugely important to me. This is the proper democratization of the media business. It's very exciting unless you're a media owner. Mm. I think then it's a scary proposition and you'll try to buy up whatever you can to keep control and to keep a, a throttle hold on advertising revenue. And I think it's scary to government because government inherently don't like change. The party who are in are conservatives by definition. Um, so they want things to stay the same. I think that the audience, the consumer, the reader, the user, the EFF, understand that they are the most important part of this equation. They will decide what happens with the media, not government, not us, um, and not, not even a discussion of a small room of us like this. It needs to be a mass movement, and it is starting to happen. I'm feeling the sea change. And believe me, the rug is coming out from under traditional media in a way that I think is quite alarming to them. They needn't be afraid if they've got good content. You said it properly, Songyezo. We're all content providers. Mm. And if it's not a sexy word. It doesn't sound as good as journalist, DJ, presenter, editor. But it's far more valuable because it is, it's really the definition of what you do. Okay. We're providing content to niche and to mass audiences. And I believe the niche audience is going to become far more valuable than the mass audience okay. in the future to advertise. Thanks, Gareth. Long-winded answer to your no, question. No, that's so. great. Last one for you, Fatima. You said it best, I think. We all want a free, healthy, vibrant press. Nobody wants to pay for it. Where can we get the money to run the kinds of projects that we need to? Where do we get the money for costly investigative journalism? Can, well, you, can you help us? I mean, there's actually an obligation on the state to provide that support to build an independent and a diverse media. We're not quite sure what's actually happening with our public money. So, in fact, we are funding it. We just don't know where it's going. In some cases, we do know where it's going because ad spend is being diverted from newspapers that are too independent to newspapers that are telling the good story. Mm. So, you know, that's another battle. Um, the investment in the SABC, in TV and radio, in terms of original content, in terms of news, in terms Wonderful. of documentaries, debates, you know, we have some partners who are working on trying to hold the SABC board accountable. So we're still doing very 1994 work on institutions that by now should have been presenting much more quality independent media. Mm. So unfortunately, you have to go to the private sector, a donor such as myself. Mm. But I mean, if you compare the amount of resources we have to the amount of money we just spent on a fire pool, you know, it's, it's and, I, and I don't mean that in a flippant way. I think that at the heart of this is people don't realize there was a slide put up earlier about the wasteful expenditure. Mm -hmm. South Africa is not poor. We have enough money. We have a national treasury that is collecting a lot of money. It's the allocation and how we prioritize which media outlets it's going to go to this month, which media outlets it's going to go to next month. Right. Okay. So for me, you can have to go to the private sector, somebody what we call a venture philanthropist who's not interested in a commercial rate of return, who's just interested in breaking even. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, you have to go to your users, readers, consumers, whatever you want to call it. You have to go to your staff, set up something like The Guardian, you know, where you establish a, a trust. 
or you have to go to a bunch of individual philanthropists or very wealthy South African business people who will actually fund uh, a free and independent media for at least the next 20 years. I think that people are not sufficiently concerned. I, you know, for me, I worry every night that we're going to go back to having one or two basically publications or original content sources where you can actually get accurate, reliable media, not just mm. some hashtags, you know, around something that's really <laughs> hilarious. Mm. Um, and so I think it's quite serious. I don't want to live in a country like Zimbabwe, which it currently is, or Swaziland, where there is an onslaught against independent media. And I think if we're serious that that is something that is at the heart of our constitution and what we want, then we're gonna to have to find innovative ways of funding it. So Iraj and the other person who was on the business panel, you know, let's see your CSI in the media space. Absolutely, well said, Fatima. Guys, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we don't have more time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I know, I'm so sorry, Lunka, but Thank you very much to our erstwhile media panel. That was dazzling. And now, please will you welcome back on stage for your listening pleasure, the wonderful vocal stylings of Deep Fried Man. Hi. Um, to the, for those of you who saw my set earlier, during my set uh, I discussed uh, a, a bunch of, of issues that have been in the news, but there was one issue that I left to last. Hello darkness, you old puss, how will I cook all this couscous? My television is an ornament I'm going to miss the cricket tournament Bad decisions have landed us in cuck What the fuck goes on within the halls of ESCOM. Does anyone remember 90s R&B? Any Aaliyah fans? Good. It's been a long time since ESCOM left us without some warm toast for breakfast. Breakfast, 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 breakfast. What do we do in darkest days? Let's just go out for takeaways. But if we do, how do we stop all of our food from going off? So why don't we just have a graze, just like they did in caveman days. We'll have to take a little stroll for fire lighters and some coal. If they implement stage three, we're just gonna have to bry again, bry again, bry again, bry again. If they implement stage three, we're just gonna have to bry again. Any Kanye West fans? We're living in the 21st century without the ability to provide every family with electricity. Screams from the DA, everybody dissing me and trying to blame me. Don't you know I'm Jay-Z? No one land can have all that power. Load shedding just for a few hours. Cold water just for a few showers. A cold shower can still cure AIDS. <laughs> but uh, keeping it local briefly, because sometimes I like to keep it local. Did you hear the news on the radio today? A brand new power station after a four year delay. I can't wait till it is online. Oh no. Politicians can't agree. So much controversy. But a brand new power station sure sounds good to me. I can't wait till it is online. Oh no, me doopy 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 doo. Why? Da 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 da. Me doopy 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 doo. Why? And then there's the romantic side of load shedding that a lot of people don't want to talk about, but I'll talk about it. 
just hope that the Marvin Gaye family don't sue me. I know how they can be. It goes like this, it goes. Baby, it seems like we are loaded. It's time to go to bed. And baby, all these candles make it seem like we have planned it. It's so romantic. And when load shedding is happening, I need a sexual distraction. Sexual distractions during stage two. Sexual distractions, cause there's nothing, there's nothing left that we can do. Oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, there's no power tonight. So what, so what, so what, so what? Let's make love tonight. You guys have been awesome. Before I get out of here, I really do know my audience. Um, I'm not wearing the correct hat for the song, but at least my bow tie is the right color. Goes like this, it goes. In the presidential chair sat a man accused of things. But I told the media that I would kill or die for him. But then the president and me, we began to disagree. So he fired the whole youth league. But we don't care, cause we, we look great in a stylish red beret. A stylish red beret, a stylish red beret. We look great in a stylish red beret. A stylish red beret, a stylish red beret. Now my friends, are all on board, Dali Andile and Floyd, and we no longer have to sing. Umshiniwam, umshiniwam. We are revolutionaries who want nationalization, and we'll be taking back some land without any compensation. Some white people laughing at that. You won't be laughing when it happens. We look great in a stylish red beret. A stylish red beret. A stylish red beret. Come sing, even white people. We look great in a stylish red beret. A stylish red beret. A stylish red beret. Thank you very much. Peace. Deep fried man. Don't go anywhere yet. I just want to prove a point to people on Twitter. We are not the same fucking person. Um, <laughs> give it up for Deep Fried Man. Fuck, I was, I was just in Botswana for like two shows, and after like the eighth person was like, can I get a picture with you? I realized they were looking for him. Fuck, so embarrassing. I love that song you did. I don't know what they're talking about. Anyway, it's ridiculous. Right, so we have your next speaker next up. Just before we bring him on, I just I feel I need to tell you this because something happened to me and I've heard lots of talk about how the country's poked and all this stuff today and how it's all going wrong. But I was in a small town that I'm not going to name because Wellington is still very uh, averse, but be very careful of people in small towns, particularly white people, because I, I had to go to a, a, a music show called Ramfest and then um, after like three days I decided to go into town and buy the hippies some soap because you can be creative but you don't have to smell like that. And then... And then I went to the spa, and then I forgot that I'm myself. And then when I went into the spa, like I walked quickly because I knew suddenly I got that small town syndrome where I realized I was in trouble. So I raced down the aisle, and then when I turned, I realized it was like between me and the exit, there were like people from a small town. Never, ever mess with them when they're cornered. And, um, and then you must also never trust white people wearing khaki. It's never ended well for anyone ever in history whether you're a rhino or a Jew or a black dude, it's going to end really badly for you. Especially when they're wearing four different kinds of khaki and they assume that's a whole outfit. And one of those started coming towards me down the aisle. I assume it was a woman because she had less facial hair than me. And she was sort of lung arming carbohydrates into a trolley and dragging what she would probably call her child, I'd call a born loser, down the aisle. <laughs> and then uh, I was panicked, you know, like when you, when you get panicked and you're not sure how to get out of this without, it's very hard being an aggressive pacifist because you don't know what to do. So I, I was like struggling to figure it out. And that's when she stopped and looked at this like sort of little protein sample Ponzi scheme on the floor. 
this little monster who, who was thinking now because he stopped drooling and um, kind of looked up at me and this woman, I think, just looked up, pointed at me and said, look, look what can happen. <laughs> I was like, she's right, you can evolve, fucking run. Anyway, he's an amazing adventurer. He's done all sorts of ridiculous mad things in a canoe. Please really welcome Rian Mansa. Good afternoon, everybody, and um, thank you. Sure, I've been excited eh, to, to be here. I've been preparing for a while. So, um, I mean, I woke up at 9 o'clock this morning to prepare my speech. I didn't do that. I've been excited to be here. It's been awesome to be on the same stage. Firstly, to the guys from Daily Maverick for inviting me to be part of this. For all the awesome guys that filled the seats today, amazing to be bumping into you guys in the, in the hallways. And then to you guys who've given up your time and your money to be here. Thank you. Um, we wouldn't be, we'd be talking to an empty room if you guys weren't here. So thank you. Um, sure. Uh, one thing that I've seen today and, and the people that I've seen speaking before me has just reminded me of one thing. And if you spend time with you, you'll see that I normally am excited about our country by nature. But the more and more people I've bumped in, into the Juliuses and the other people and the, the editors of massive um, newspapers in our country, I've just realized how different we all are. And I'm excited again. I tell you, I'm excited. I, I realize this little story. I always tell people about how special our country is is the absolute truth. Why are we special? Because we are so, so different. Normally that's a negative thing. No, it's not. The fact that we're all so different makes our country the special one. I sometimes bring it down to the idea of perspective, where we all can see something differently because of the angles that we're looking at it. And um, it comes down to then in South Africa, value, the value you hedge to something. And um, some of you find your time more valuable. Some of you find your money more valuable to you. We're all different. How we value things. And it makes me think of a story, and I think the economists in the room are going to like this. It's a story about a guy who we think doesn't really value money like he should. It's a, it's a story about a barman who is busy sweeping the bar clean on a Sunday morning. Have you guys ever been in a nightclub the night after? A big evening. It's disgusting places, eh? And the guy's busy sweeping and cleaning up, and... Um, little bell goes and there's a guy who walks in there and you can see he's a bit tipsy. The barman looks at him and says, uh, morning sir, um, can I help you? <laughs> this guy says to him, boy, were you here last night? The guy says to him, yes sir, I worked the whole night shift, uh, the whole time. The guy looks at, uh, back at the barman and says to him, was I here last night? <laughs> the barman says, I'm so, of course you were. You were one of the last to leave. You sat on the left-hand side. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. And the guy now feeling in his tipsy state, feeling quite proud. He's getting the right answers. And he says to the barman, did I spend money here last night? The guy says, yes, you did, sir. You actually, in fact, you did. How much money did I spend here last night? And um, the guy says to him, sir, 200 rand. Yeah, 200 rand. That's right. Exactly 200 rand. The guy, so proud of himself, puffs his chest out. He's feeling proud. He's about to walk out of this bar. He looks back at the barman and he says, sure, that's a relief. I thought I lost that 200 rand. <laughs> what you value, money and where you put it. Guys, today I want to share with you, firstly, I want to entertain with you. Um, I want to entertain you and I want to share with you just where I've been in the last 15 years of my life. I've had an interesting 15 years. I think you're going to love some of the stories that I share with you and you're going to see yourself in those stories um, firstly. And secondly, I think um, the message that I've been trying to share with so many South Africans and people worldwide is that message that there is an ocean between saying and doing. You've all stood around the fire. You've all... You, you, You've stood around the fire with that beer in hand. You've had your friends around you, and you guys have spoken about things that you're going to do. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And you speak, and you speak, and you speak, and what happens when you leave there? You don't do. And sure, I, I think my story is going to um, uh, share that principle and that idea with you. My change in my life started 14 years ago, and it started in the Newlands Forest in Cape Town. Who of you have been to Newlands Forest? in Cape Town. 
Okay, some of you must ask your bosses for leave so that you can get to see our country. But Newlands Forest is next to um, UCT, the, 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 the university. And um, hey man, I'd gone for a run on a Sunday afternoon. Now, Sunday is relevant for the story. I had finished my run, sat on this rock, beautiful forest around me, my dogs playing in the river, and sure, I start telling myself, Rion, life is good. Life is actually good. You've got a, a good job. You've got money in the bank. You've got a pretty girlfriend that likes you. That is relevant. I mean, and um, life is good. At the same time, I'm thinking that, guys, in the pit of my stomach, I've got this feeling, this nauseous feeling. It's that feeling that I think all of you get when you hear the carte blanche music start playing on a Sunday night. You guys know what's happening the next day, hey? You're going back to work. It's Monday morning blues. And it's not that you don't like your work, it's just that you've done what you've always wanted to. Right there and then, I said, I am going to change my life and I'm going to do something incredible. This line that you see is where I took a bicycle, not a motorbike. I was all alone, unaided, no sponsors. Exactly where that line goes is where I cycled. I went up the west coast. There were a lot of wars in Africa at the time and I needed to get through them. I wanted to go through every single country. You can see I've just gone through Liberia over there. Who's watched Blood Diamond, the movie? That movie was made four or five years after I was, I'd cycled through that country while it was in the war, in the grips of that war. I went through the Sahara Desert, can you believe it, in a 50 kilogram bicycle. The north of Africa, I really thought it was gonna be, um, I don't know, I was naive. I thought it was gonna be a lot more European and a bit more um, organized with roads, I was wrong. Guys, do you see where the line just went through over there? That's Cairo. Please, I'm going to save you guys all the embarrassment of making the oldest joke in the book with me. From Cairo to Cape Town is not all downhill. <laughs> so please, just save yourselves on that one. I carried on cycling down, kept going, kept going. Sure, um, I thought it was going to be a bit easier on this part of the continent. 20 kilometers an hour, I kept cycling and landed up back at exactly the same place I started two years, two months, and 15 days before. Please don't applaud, because I told my girlfriend it would take one year. I mean, if I go for bread and milk now, it's a massive trust issue between us. <laughs> I um, went through 37,000 kilometers, quite a long distance, 34 countries. I've been to more African countries than our last three presidents all put together. I saw the 20 kilometers an hour. I can tell you about those countries. I met important people on the way, had great times. One thing if you had to say to me, Rian, we've got this short time together, but I want you to tell me, how did that journey change your life and the way you see people? So I'm gonna try and share the Reader's Digest version of the Reader's Digest version, okay? So forgive me. Yo, people I met along the way changed the way I see the world and s see my continent. Um, I arrived in Abidjan, our ambassador in, in um, Ivory Coast said to me, Rian, if you go to Liberia, you've promised Minister Zuma that you're not going to um, Liberia. You know the war is on. And I lied to her. I walked out of her office and I said, ma'am, I, I, I won't be going to Liberia. She said to me, we will withdraw all your diplomatic um, support, no passport, and we will not bring your dead body out of Liberia. For a little kid, I tell you what, it hits home, eh? I keep going, I'm stubborn. I've told people I'm going around the continent. I kept going. First night I sleep in Liberia. The photos you see of some of these places are thick jungle. Liberia is dense, dense, thick jungle. No proper roads, little clay, hard, soil eroded um, roads. And I get into um, the second day of Liberia. I've slept one night, I think things are okay. People have chased me through every single village. If you go on Google Earth, you'll be able to see the part of Liberia I was in, very rural. I Start this morning early again at about six o'clock. Seven o'clock, I get um, into this one village. It's right on top of a hill. I am too tired to cycle away from the guys who are busy chasing me now. I'd seen them on the right-hand side of me, and I tried to cycle with everything I had, but it was difficult with this heavy bicycle. Sure, if you ask me what I remember so clearly was the slapping of these kids' feet behind me on that clay ground. I can remember as I look back, the one guy had tackled me off the bicycle, American football style. The one guy grabbed me by my hair and um, other guys just ripped the bicycle away, taking me to where the older guys were sitting there with their guns and, and busy smoking drugs out of this big bottleneck. Of course I was scared. I sat against this wall with my arms over my knees like this and I employed logic. I wasn't abrasive. I didn't argue with anybody. 
I didn't make eye contact with anybody. And the guys were screaming and shouting at me and they were all high and drugged. Um, the one guy was kicking me for about two hours on the side of my body, like I said, as I sat up there and I didn't get angry. And I, I remember thinking, how am I gonna get out of this? And my only response was stay calm, do your best, try get out of here. Guys, they took me off to about three hours to this dungeon that was near the place where they had tackled me. In this dungeon, it was uh, sunken into the ground, a dark place, little windows. My bicycle is alongside me. On the right hand side, I've got a guy sitting behind this little school desk and in front of me, all these guys busy shouting and going crazy but on these reed benches. Yo, I comply with everything that they want. I comply and I do what they want and I comply. Um, I think I'm busy solving this problem. I can't explain to you how it just pulled the carpet from underneath my feet when I had the guys on the left-hand side of me, about six of them, one 15-year-old guy, bullish and loud. He was saying to the guys next to him, not threatening me, massive difference. He was saying to them, let's gut him, let's kill him, we are wasting time. Let's gut him, let's kill him, we're wasting time. If you know what pigeon English sounds like, you'll understand. And here, I consider myself a brave guy. And here I was standing with my knees busy shaking. Who of you have been that scared when your knees actually shake? Properly shake. I stood there and I was embarrassed. In my Africa book, I write about how embarrassed I was. But I, sure, I just kept packing up the stuff. 26th of February, 2004, I was telling myself that's going to be on my gravestone. And I also said to myself, Rian, you actually are the idiot that everybody said you were. This whole idea of going around Africa on the bicycle, today you will see it. And there I was, um, hopeless. What gets me out of that? The guy sees a, uh, a magazine I had with Mr. Mbeki's face and our president at the time. He looks at the picture of Mr. Mbeki. He talks to me for the first time and he says, this is my friend. So like a good captive, being held by drug rebels, I disagreed with him. That is a joke. Thanks for the guys who caught that joke. If you've been held by drug rebels, rule number one, don't disagree with them. I walked, I threw my bike against the wall and I went and stood next to this guy and I kept looking at Mr. Mbeki's face, apologizing, saying, sir, probably you were friends with him. You guys have heard of Charles Taylor? Mr. Mbeki had just been in there to take Charles Taylor out. Maybe he had seen him. I stared at this picture of Mr. Mbeki. The guy begins to laugh and starts pointing at Mr. Mbeki's beard, at the little gray hairs, and I do not know what he is laughing about. But what do I begin doing? Laughing with him and laughing. My knees shaking, he stops laughing, I move back to my bicycle. 15 minutes later, out of the blue, the guy just says, go before we kill you. Like an African version of bon voyage. <laughs> Travel well. I didn't disagree with him this time, my bike out bump up on the little hill. I remember stopping and looking back at just what I'd gone through for eight hours and I looked at the guys coming out of the room, half of them coming out and busy waving me goodbye. <laughs> Very confused. Guys, the lesson I want you to take out of that is one kilometer later, what do you think I did when I stopped my bicycle to take stock? What do you think I did? I took out my little map, my little laminated map, small little notepad, my pen, and I calculated the average speed I needed to do to catch up the eight hours of inconvenience. Now, come on, if you are telling me that you are focused in what you're busy doing, no matter what field you're in, politics, in economics, in journalism, it does not matter. No matter how big or small your goal is, if you're not focused in the beginning, you're not going to make it. Not once did I think about stopping and going home. I carried on, got to Sierra Leone, the country next door, and here I was in for the lesson of my entire life. I get hosted by the United Nations in Freetown, and the guy says to me, Rian, do us a favor and speak at this camp that we sponsor. Hey, Amen. they'd love your story. Guys, I get there in the morning, and Yo, I can't even see people, but I set up my little map of Africa, and I'm ready now to present to the people. Whoa, the people start coming in. Everybody's either got an arm off over here or an arm off over here, or they've got a leg off over here. Yeah, stuff I'd only seen on TV, and I, I'm busy telling them my story, and it's about 200 people one meter away from me. Grandmothers, grandfathers, men, women, babies, and I stand there, and I tell them my story. As I leave off the stage, I am so emotional, I can't even speak. The people applaud. On those trestle tables that they had in that hall were slamming their arms down and they were busy applauding me. I leave, I walk out of this gate and I remember, I, it was a bit of a haze, but I remember I turned on the road, somebody tapping me on the shoulder, I turn around, here's a lady with her baby, beautiful lady, beautiful big smile, and all she wants from me is to know if I can pass on a message to her family that's en route to where I'm going. So, we chat a bit, I can't help notice her baby's arm is off at the elbow, her baby's about a year old. 
No South African is just going to go to a stranger and say, how did that happen to you, your finger or your foot? Uh, I said to her, how, ma'am, how is this possible? Hey, man, I stand there, I listen to her story about how she was in the middle of the night, woken up near the border of Sierra Leone and Liberia by these guys in a convoy of cars and trucks, heard people together like cattle, they had lights on them, she said, and then they chose people randomly, you, 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 you. In Blood Diamond, they talk about giving people the option of long sleeve or short sleeve. She's in this queue. She says people are stumbling out of this room where they got candles up and the pangas up. She's standing and telling me the story, and I can't even connect directly. It feels like I'm totally out of the story. She says she went in there and she begged him. She said, my husband has died in this war. Uh, I don't come from this village. And then she said what she thought you'd understand. I have my baby to look after. The guy immediately nodded to the guy. She said on her right-hand side, he ripped her baby away, threw her baby on the table, chopped her baby's arm off, and then she said immediately he threw the baby back at her, and the guy kicked her from behind and said to her, go, we've given you what you want. We've given you what you want. And she said she went out there, and she said, hey, the world just she thought was going to end right there. The baby, while she's telling me that story, is with its other arm busy playing with my shirt. Giggling and laughing, playing with my shirt. Guys, if you've ever rolled your eyes, when somebody has told you, no matter who you are in this hall, that you should be grateful for what you've got, believe it. I used to not be grateful for everything I had. I'm super grateful. Um, sure, I, I, I tell you what, I'm being grateful for running water, one thing, and electricity, obviously, that works all the time. Um, I'm not going to make electricity joke, but running water, goodness gracious, man, here I am, I, um, you can't get bottled water on this bicycle trip on, just to clear that up, okay? You don't go to little shops and buy bottled water. I was getting water from little wells and then from rivers. Most excitingly, Angola has got these monstrous rivers in the jungles. I would stop my bicycle, climb off and slide down these monster banks. I would get to the river, sometimes some crocodiles and hippos around. I'd fill my water bottle, being alert drink some of the water, the sun would always go through the bottle. And you know when you have the sun going through water, you see little pieces? You do, eh? Fill up the water again, close it, back to my bicycle. This day, the road followed the river up a mountain pass. And I am, yo, I'm cycling hard. I stop after about three kilometers. I take out the water bottle and I'm drinking. I hear voices. Yo, I haven't seen any Buildings, I haven't seen firewood. Hey, I move closer to these bushes. I part the bushes. There's 20 people in the river. People busy washing their clothes. I've seen it often. Washing their clothes. Upstream. It's an important word in my story. Upstream, and people are washing their clothes. Hey, I see them chatting to other people. Alongside these people, five meters down the way. Hey, oaks have got their bubbles all over their whole bodies and they're washing themselves. Hey, I'm still looking at that. And then, five meters down from those guys, they're in conversation with the next crowd, the people that are like this, ah, having their pee and their poo. And I had the bottle of water like this, and I can tell you how I just noticed those little things were 10 times bigger. In my mind, my mind said to me, are you a man or are you a mouse? I took that bottle of water and I just downed it. Sure. Guys, I um, got back from that um, bicycle trip. Um, you know, five people and a dog said goodbye to me when I left at the waterfront. Of the five people, one was a security guard and one was a cleaner. So there's no razzmatazz, eh? I get back and media across the world are speaking to me. No human being has ever been able to do this or even attempt it. Um, I, I'm amazed. Carte Blanche does this amazing story on me. And if you spend time with me, you'll see that I am relatively cynical. I am. I, I don't come from a privileged upbringing. I didn't have a silver spoon in my mouth. And I... I I didn't believe that things would always work out for me. Sunday night, I watched this carte blanche piece. Um, for once, understand what I did for two years. My phone keeps ringing with all my friends. I take, um, while well, I'm standing in the kitchen of my friend's house, a friend of mine takes my phone out of my hand, puts another phone in my hand, and I answer, the guy from carte blanche. So I say, yeah, hi, how's it? He says to me, um, why are you not answering your phone? Mr. Nelson Mandela watched you on carte blanche and wants to know if you're willing to come meet him on Thursday morning. So I checked my diary to see if I was available. <laughs> if the person next to you didn't laugh at that joke, please explain it to them because it is a joke. <laughs> Guys, little poor, 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 poor me. Rian Mansa sitting as the guest of Mr. Nelson Mandela. Nobody else. Justin Bieber, Naomi Campbell. Hey, long love letters. 
to meet with Mr. Mandela. I, Mr. Mandela said to me, don't rest on your laurels. I didn't know what he really meant. And I decided to go to, to Madagascar. I wanted to do another place on the African continent that was special. I wanted to do something that no human being had ever done. How arrogant of me. I wanted to do something that no other human being had ever done. That kayak that you see over there, all alone, unaided, I circumnavigated and kayaked around Madagascar. I told my girlfriend it would take six months. You know where this is going, eh? It, it took a year. If I ever offer for you to come on holiday with me, you look at your watch and you look very busy and say, oh man, just if it was not this weekend. And um, Madagascar is a good example because I was in prison there five times. It's my record for one country. Five times. The last time, Google in Bovombe prison and you'll see where I was in prison. Real deal, hardcore. I think CMAX would look like a holiday to that place. Um, obviously, I hadn't done anything wrong. The problem was that I arrived in Madagascar when Andrei Rajalina was about to have a big military coup and take the country over. But when I get to the capital city, I hear about this DJ. Whoa, this DJ is exactly what you'd think a DJ would be. Earphones like this, big t-shirts, pants that are hanging around his bum, chains, spinning the discs, nightclubs of 4,000 people. That's when I arrived in Madagascar. One year later, when I finished my journey, what do you think that same DJ was doing? Suit and tie running the country. Guys like Gareth Cliff and DJ Fresh and those oaks are super unambitious. <laughs> when I own a radio station, run a country, man. My journey after that was around Iceland, Shaksai. I bit off more than I could chew. I, I'll be the first to tell you that. But there's nothing more in my entire decade and a half of this career that nobody else had um, where I learned things. I decided to take somebody with me and I tried to make it even more difficult. I took somebody that was handicapped. Who of you have got children? Now you can teach me something about understanding what it means to have somebody's life in your hands. I don't have children. I stood at this press conference, one of the first photos that you saw, and I remember the journalist asked me, so what is the biggest challenge in this journey? Oh, and I was confident and said, I'm going to know what it's like to have somebody's life in my hands. No, no further from the truth, I had no idea. After one month, the, my paddling partner hated me, the film crew hated me, because I was the only one that had to get the job done. Now guys, if you're in a leadership position or want to be in a leadership position, there is again an ocean between saying and doing. If you want to be a leader, you cannot only lead in the candy floss and lollipop moments. You cannot lead in candy floss and lollipop moments and pat yourself on the back and say, I've done well. Can you pause it there for me, Clint, if it's possible, please? I'd appreciate that. Um, you've got to lead to prove yourself when the going is the toughest you've ever thought. Because I tell you that for six months in Iceland, Every morning I woke up, I doubted that I would be able to see the day through. I doubted it. And we still made history again. And one of the people that paddled around Iceland was handicapped. We did something good, two little South Africans. Um, sure, so we got back from Iceland. Again, don't come with me if I invite you to come away for a weekend. When do I choose to go to Iceland? In the worst winter in 63 years. It's not the worst winter in Mauritius, eh? for 63 years, the worst winter in Iceland. It sounds cold already. Sure, guys, um, I want to improve every time what I'm doing in this career of mine. I want to say, I want to see what others are doing, and I want to turn it on its head. I want to do better than the next guy. That's how arrogant you have to be if you want to achieve. I look at what others do and I say, that is not good enough. If somebody's done it before me, it's not good enough. So, I'm sitting at home with my girlfriend of 14 years, Fusty sitting there with me, and we're spending time with Kim Kardashian and her sisters. The guys who laugh now, you do exactly the same. You sit and you spend time with Kim Kardashian and her sisters, and Fusty on the sofa looks at me, and she's serious, and she says to me, uh, Rian, I want to do something incredible with my life. Who of you want to do something incredible with your life? I do. I tell you what, I, I'm on this earth for 70 years. I want to do something incredible. I, I, I'm stunned with Fusty saying this. She looks at me again, and this time she says, Rian, you know I've always wanted to go to New York. And when your girlfriend says that to you, you can say, hey, let's see when the flights are. Hey, I take my humor and my adventure, and I mix the two, and I said to her, we will go to New York, but we're going to go in a little rowing boat. You can play for me, Clint, thank you. This is where we went from, from Agadir. That little line is exactly where we rowed in a little rowing boat. 
Just the two of us, 1.5 meters high was the cabin, 1.5 meters wide, and 1.5 meters long. We landed in San Salvador, the same place that Christopher Columbus landed in 1492. Fusti was the only woman from the continent of Africa in history that's ever rode an ocean. In history, it's a long time. That is incredible. We're the only human beings, the two of us, two silly, thank you. Now we know how many women are in the audience. Two little South Africans, the only human beings in history to row from Africa all the way to North America. It's unbelievable, man. We're living in 2014, 2015. How is that possible? Two quick little stories before I um, wrap up. Guys, it was, it was tough. Imagine being 1.5 meters space, shoulder to shoulder with your best friend or your girlfriend or your wife or your husband, shoulder to shoulder. Can you imagine one day? Imagine a week, imagine a month, imagine two months, three months, four months, four and a half months we were in that little boat. Fusty said that she sometimes got so angry, she wanted to take that oar and cut my head off, but then she would pause for a second and think, oh, I need him to row. <laughs> we were thrown over by a big um, wave, it was about nine meters um, in height, which is nearly as high as that, and our boat weighed a ton. The boat threw us and threw me out of the boat. I landed outside the boat. I was washed underneath the water. Fusty got caught underneath the boat. It was violent. We both thought we were going to die. 2,300 kilometers from any land. Just us, little boat. Guys, I landed at the back of the, the boat, foam splashing. I popped out of the foam, held the, uh, by chance this rope in my hand that was attached to the boat. I'm five meters behind the boat. I see Fusty pop up, the boat pops up. Fusty sitting there, her feet got stuck into her footholds. She holds onto this, the ropes on the side over here. She looks a bit scared. She looks to the left hand side of me. I don't know what's happened either. She looks back at me. And if you ever meet Fusty, tell her you know the story. Just after this happened, Fusty looks again to the left hand side behind me and she shouts at me, behind you, go get the olive oil. Go get the olive oil, it's behind you. We've just been, come on man, we nearly died and she wants the olive oil. She just, I think, felt guilty. Guys, the last thing was, um, she, we're heading up the coast now, we've arrived in Miami, um, we're about 15 kilometers away, and these two big helicopters are circling us. Yo, I'm wondering, what are these big helicopters? And then two big boats circling us. One boat comes up to us, and the boat... Um, has got three people on. One guy unclips himself from these big seats. He comes and stands closer. He's got his hand on his gun like this. He's about five meters away from the boat. The other guys stand with their, their rifles behind um, the console. And the other driver stands there ready to go. The guy says to me, where do you come from? So I said, oh, I'm from South Africa. And he says, no, where have you rode this thing from? So then I thought to myself, shucks, I can't tell this guy I rode from Africa. He's not going to believe me. Yo, I say to him, oh, we rode from the Bahamas, Andros Island. He looks at the boat and he says, we heard that there were Colombian refugees that were coming to America. Yeah, I'm standing on this boat, got my coffee in my hand, like this, I'm in my underpants, and I've got this massive beard, and I, don't, I forget what I look like. Sure, he pauses, asks a few more questions, and then, ding, ding, the bell goes off for him. He says, yeah, you're right, uh, Cuban refugees wouldn't be coming on boats with sponsors' logos on. I thought, well, could have worked it out yourself, my friend. Anyway, then they gave us an escort into Miami Harbor. Helicopters, I thought, had cameras in, but they were actually the guns. I thought they were the, the, the people filming us. We arrived in Miami and made the history. Um, that's been the last 15 years of my life, of doing what everybody said was not possible. When I spoke, I made sure that I backed it up with the action. There's an ocean between saying and doing. Guys, write down three things that I leave with you, please, or remember them or forget them, but they're three things that will mean something to you. In my career, if you sat with me and you asked me what were those three things that made everything possible, the first thing, courage. You're going to see how this is going to overlap in your life. Courage is something that's lacking in every single one of you. It's lacking in me. Because sometimes I'm so fearful to take something on right in the beginning that I don't ever get a chance to really realize those dreams. David and Goliath, you guys know the story of David and Goliath. People say he was a hero when he defeated the giant. He wasn't. He was a hero when everybody stood on that battlefield, hearts in their throat, and the giant was walking towards them. David was the only guy that stepped forward and said, 
I'll take him on. You guys see where that, that courage comes in there. The second thing, perseverance. You have to see things through if you want to get the reward. You have to be willing to keep going and going and going. Nothing is ever finished if it's not finished. All the things, I challenge you, all the things in your life that have value for you, that mean something to you, all took time. Is that fair enough? And then the third thing, hey man, it's something that I'm so guilty of. Who of you have ever had the wrong attitude? None of you, hey, it's only me. Guys, our attitude at the beginning of a task dictates whether we make a success of that task. We as South Africans believe we've got it inside our DNA to make things happen. And trust me, we do. We do make things happen. But I challenge you next time you guys are sitting in that environment as a, as a, a, a union or a political party or a, a, a journalist set up and you guys are discussing stuff that is not fun for your business, the stuff that makes you feel uncomfortable. I challenge you, look around that room. Only two types of people. People with the right attitude and people with the wrong attitude. Forget about that person that's sitting next to you or sitting across from the table from you. Ask yourself honestly, what attitude are you going to have? Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you, Rian. Thank you. Yes, I'm back on my feet. It was just John Flissmas after oil. Um, <laughs> Wow, Rian, you don't have enough problems in life. All over the world in a bicycle. Why? <laughs> I find people you are yet to struggle in life. <laughs> Run around the world on a bicycle. Anyway, now you guys are very patient and your patience is about to pay off. I am now going to introduce back onto stage Ranjani Munsami and our guest of Hono. Please welcome her back. Where's your applause? Thank you. And she will, of course, introduce our guest of honor. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a long day. Have you enjoyed it so far? Okay, so let's have you, Delhi. Okay, so let's take this baby home. Our final guest today is a person who burst onto the political scene, first through Cossas and then the NC Youth League. He once said he would take up arms and kill for Jacob Zuma, and then decided it wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> he was expelled from the NC for being too chacharach, and then he became its biggest nightmare. He brought us pay back the money, and now he wants to bring us economic freedom in our lifetime. Please welcome the Commander-in-Chief of the Economic Freedom Fighters, Julius Malema. Well, thank you, Julius. You couldn't join us today. We had a long day. We had a very dramatic day. Um, you were writing exams. I take it you weren't studying taxation law. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So can you share with us maybe what, what were you studying? No, today I was writing uh, business management. I'm studying BA with UNISA. This was my last subject uh, on uh, specializing in politics and citizenship. So how did it go? Did you pass? Well, uh, you can't praise uh, horses which have not returned. <laughs> so they must first return and we know which one is number one. Okay. <laughs> All right, so exactly two years ago, you and I sat down um, at a hotel nearby here. You had also just finished writing your exams. Yeah. And um, you said to me that you were going to launch a political party. I thought you were joking. I thought like, you know, people finish right exams, they normally go drinking. He wants to start a political party. <laughs> so the EFF is now two years old from that moment. Um, is it what you envisaged it would be? Well, uh, the EFF is uh, an organization that continues to make us very proud because uh, we knew that South Africans are looking for an alternative. And uh, the EFF, within a short space of time, contested elections. And uh, now it's represented in almost all the legislatures. 
busy now preparing for local government elections from uh, April up until now I have not addressed less than 30 communities with less than 1,000 people participating in those meetings. So we're busy uh, strengthening the organization, we're busy on the ground, listening to our people so that uh, when we take over some of the municipalities, we know exactly what our people want. Okay, so I, I must admit that when we did do that interview, I wondered whether you were doing this out of revenge and anger because of the way you were expelled. And you did, you did put up one heck of a fight to get back into the NC. Um, and then when it was clear that you, that you couldn't get back in, you then decided to launch the economic freedom, freedom fight. You were very angry, weren't you? Well, uh, there's a difference between anger and disappointment. I was disappointed. It couldn't be anger because there is no anger that can be sustained for two years. Uh, this is what I, I think uh, uh, is a brainchild of the ordinary masses on the ground who said we want uh, an alternative to the NC. And uh, we were of a view that we must form a non-governmental organization which will agitate for economic freedom and it should not be politically aligned. But uh, the response on the ground was such that you are wasting our time, we need an alternative and that alternative should represent the working class. Yeah, so, so what you're doing is exact. What you did, rather, is exactly what Zuel Zimavavi is not doing. He dragged out his departure from Kosatu, so he's 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 basically on a mobilisation drive. Whereas you said, okay, I'm out. What I'm doing is I'm launching a, a political party, and you did it, and it, it took on a life of its own. He will do it. Uh, he's got no option. So uh, you're not you're not worried that he's gonna. You don't worry that he's going to compete for your constituency? There's a difference between forming a political party and the union. And uh, even if Vavi was to form a political party, it will never be a threat to the EFF because uh, the mobilization at the level of a union is such that you are confined to uh, shop floor politics. And the uh, capital, by its own nature, organizes people into one place. You already find them organized by your enemy called capital, unlike politics. Political formations, you have to go to villages and then do door to door and ask people to come to a meeting. After speaking to thousands of them through a door to door, all of them confirming they will come to a meeting. On the day of the meeting, they don't come. And uh, if you've got a big ego, you'll, you'll then be demoralized and then pull out of it. But it needs experience, it needs a determination, it needs you to soldier on and continue to sell the message. Because what matters is not an individual, is whether you've got the message. People want the message. Okay. Um, so you've been going for two years now. You, you've made a lot of noise on the political scene. You've provided a lot of color to the political scene. But in, in your view, what substantive has the EFF achieved in the time it's been alive? The EFF has uh, provided an alternative uh, policy perspective to the country, including to the ANC. It is the only uh, socialist party that speaks about socialism openly in parliament. It's the but only socialism party. by what definition? Because that's a moving target, seemingly. No, no. Socialism by the definition of state ownership of strategic uh, sectors of the economy. And that will, amongst others, include land, um, uh, mines, the banks, and other monopoly industries. And uh, we have put firmly uh, those proposals before Parliament. We are actually the first organization to take the battle to capital and said to Parliament, you do not have legislature that uh, uh, stops uh, profit shifting uh, and open corruption committed by capital because you are scared of corruption, and now everybody begins to say, no, there should be a legislation about that. We spoke about the conditions of workers, uh, not only in the mining sector, the workers who are working in the restaurants, the security guards, uh, the domestic workers, uh, farm workers, firmly, unashamedly spoke on their behalf uh, uh, in, in, in parliament. To an extent that the ANC had to 
even reject the investigation of living and working condition of mine workers by parliament because it was brought by the EFF. Things that they, they were not doing, actually, uh, they were engaged in elitist type of politics, which ordinary masses on the ground could not relate with. And now masses can relate with those politics. That's why the parliament channel is, is so popular now, because the masses feel represented. And, and, and they begin to say, we are represented. I want to watch because the likelihood is that my issues may be discussed by parliament. So a lot of people thought initially that the EFF may be a kind of a carbon copy of the, the NC, but for angry people and people who are disappointed. Uh, you know, even in, in the election last year, you found people who were really angry with the NC and couldn't in good conscience vote NC because of the, the kind of scandals uh, and, and stories of corruption associated with the NC now. So you came out of the NC, you, you, the NC's mutated baby. So that's why people kind of thought, okay, you know. So, but do you think that's sustainable? Well, uh, those who were angry uh, are people like Cope. Uh, that, that's why that's why they disagreed and then had to disappear. Um, 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 uh, uh, because when the anger subsided, then your purpose disappeared. Because you are you are formed for angry purpose. So we are formed on ideological basis, uh, to an extent that we even wrote a founding manifesto, which Cope doesn't have to articulate what we represent. So, so even if Malema is tomorrow is happy and is now ready again to kill for Zuma, there will be people who remain loyal to the document called the Founding Manifesto. So the ANC is 103 years old. It's the party of Nelson Mandela, of Oliver Tambo. You revered these leaders. Um, there must be part of you that's still a bit heart sore that you, you couldn't follow, you know, in the succession of that, the, that, the, you know, legion of, of really heroic people that, the, you know, you, the party would not and will now never be handed over to you. Uh, do, you do you feel that sometimes when you see the flag, when you, when, you, when you look back at visuals of those great speeches, the great men? Well, we're following in their footsteps. Uh, on, a, on a different, uh, you know, organization called the, the EFF. And not only Nelson Mandela, uh, uh, because he was not the only one who fought for our freedom. We're following in the footsteps of uh, Sebukwe. We're following the footsteps of uh, uh, Steve Bigo. Uh, we're following in the footsteps of all great giants that fought for our freedom. The, the problem with the ANC is that uh, it, it, it uh, you know, they, they indoctrinate people to an extent that you think it is only them in South Africa and everybody else doesn't exist. And you come to realize that once you are outside that, yes, yes we've been denied a rich history. <laughs> you know, we've been denied a rich history of this country of so many gr great giants who, who fought for our freedom. And, and uh, we, we shouldn't die for a name. We shouldn't be obsessed that you no know, want to be in the ANC because it can only be achieved in the ANC. It can be achieved for as long as you've got, you know, the collective which has got a political will to achieve that which a generation before us set as a mission. Okay, but you fell out with this current leadership of the, of the ANC. So let me give you a scenario. President Jacob Zuma decides in a few months, in a few years, I don't know when, but decides to retire to Nkandla and um, the, the next ANC conference. There's no one, man, who can make you go back to the ANC. No one. <laughs> no, but, but no, let no, me give you a there scenario. There's no Nelson Mandela. There's no O.R. Tambo. There's no Peter Mukaba. They all died with the ANC. All you have is a group of individuals. But we had a dynamic young man here this morning, Paul Mashatile. He's, he's a new generation ANC leader. Uh, Paul belongs to that elite group that continues to milk our resources. And then he comes here, and then 
and then and then he comes here and he wants to behave brave. Let's hope he won't say you distorted him on what he said about Jacob Zuma because uh, the fact that he said, I hope he said that he doesn't agree with the and like was report, I was not here, I was going to tell him, repeat it, so that when, <laughs> when, when the newspapers quote you on that, you must not say they didn't hear you properly. <laughs> All of you, tomorrow you will still be here in South Africa. Paul is going to correct what he said before you here. <laughs> so there's nothing brave about him. He's part of a mess. Paul presided over a government that put a lot of money in the so-called Alexandra renewal. Till today, Alexander looks like a squatter camp. Where did the money go? Where was Paul? Paul was at the center of that money. He, before he tells us about Intleco money, he must tell us about the Alexander renewal. So do you have any, do you have any friends in the NC? Are there any people? Of course. That, do you, uh, of you, course. You, you were quite um, f friendly with Minister Razmataz for a while. is my friend. I speak to him. I don't agree with him, you know. <laughs> Uh, but I speak to him and he knows I don't agree with him. Okay, so and uh, there are a lot of elders in the ANC that I speak to. I speak to Winnie Mandela. I speak to Castle Matali. Uh, because our relationship in politics went beyond political relationship and became that of a, a family uh, friends. So even if those friends had to influence an NC conference to take a resolution to build bridges with the EFF, you wouldn't accept that? Winnie tried. And if I can say no to Winnie, who else can come and talk to me? <laughs> yeah, though, there is no one amongst those big mouses that holds uh, the necessary courage to can convince me. No one. I told Winnie that they don't like you we, we know you are suffering and you are calling us to come back so that we can join the queue of suffering people. <laughs> we are not coming back to that organization. Okay, but the, the NC is not the only party that has problems. Your party has had some problems also. There's some Which people. Ones? <laughs> Which problems? <laughs> well, you've, you've expelled some, some people who are quite high ranking in your party. Well, you know, EFF is a very dynamic organization because it's not constituted by celebrities. And anyone who defines himself... But then why himself, did you recruit them to serve in your caucus? No one was recruited. They came and joined. No one... I didn't go... I don't even know where they stay. So I wouldn't <laughs> have recruited them. So they came, and then they wanted to behave like celebrities within a collective, and the collective rejected them. So you didn't go to Gayton's house for all these famous sushi parties? And I mean, bring serious name. We're talking serious issues here. <laughs> are you willing to build bridges with? Musi Maimani is the new leader of the DA. Helen Zilla said she didn't want to cooperate with you uh, on a, in a, any kind of coalition government. But next year, we are heading for a very contested election. The opportunity may arise to change power in some of the metros, to some of the municipalities, to a coalition uh, uh, government. Would you be willing to cooperate with the D Democratic Alliance? Well, I, 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 I work. Well, cooperation might mean something different. I, 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 I support anyone that advances the national interest. If Musi stand up in parliament and say, say, uh, uh, Zuma must pay back the money or that Zuma must release uh, the Nkandla report, I will stand up and support him. Uh, in the same way, uh, if the ANC still has got some people who